we're at this inflection point in the history of VR where creators, makers, technologists, you, Mr. Gaeta here beside me, have to choose, you know, what kind of world we're going to create as we build out um, this matrix universe that we're all so excited about and a little bit perhaps frightened about. So today we're really gonna unpack um, what um, John's and his team's vision is in terms of this future that we're creating. And I think, you know, it's appropriate that we start with that scene from the matrix because we need to figure out what pills we're actually going to decide to take and what that means. So John, what pill are you creating or taking right now? <laughs> uh, it's good that the audience is made up of adults. <laughs> uh, I think that adults have the capacity to understand the, uh, the double edge of, of some of this. Uh, yeah, in one edge, it could lead towards um, like a renaissance in art and science. It could, it could lead to enlightenment, you know, as people sort of like their minds are opened by way of experiences that they could never have in real life. Uh, the other side of the, uh, the sword uh, could go down the darker path, as we know, um, where some folks who are less sophisticated and less caring or thoughtful could make content that could be harmful and or uh, create platforms that can be used to spy upon people, for example. Uh, so we have to like go in eyes wide open. Um, the, the whole time I've been sort of uh, intrigued by this topic, I'm driven by, oh, this could be a, sort of a revolutionary new uh, canvas art form and something quite great for expression and so I can't resist it, you know? Uh, like a lot of things you can't resist. But um, I think it's really worthwhile to sort of like make sure that for those who care, you know, that they're just keeping in mind the two edges of the sword. Of the sword. Um, so or as, as far as the pill uh, I'd like to take, uh, well, I guess it depends. So, you know, we're not at the red pill. That's a ways away, but it's potentially within our lifetime certainly within the lifetime of our kids or grandkids, you know, if we have sort of empathy for their experiences. Um, I, right at the moment, uh, the pill I would like to take is a purple pill. And um, there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a few ways I could describe the purple pill. I mean, um, it does not, uh, we're, the, th the next five years or ten years isn't, right now we're in some like kind of like uh, excited state, everyone's in an excited state about the promise. Uh, a lot of, um, a lot of talk, but um, you know, and right after the VR bubble, there's going to be an AR bubble or a mixed reality bubble, um, and then the bubbles will mush together. Right, so that eventually in about 10 years you have probably, I don't even know if it's glasses, but you have like some interface that can go from zero to 100. So zero being where we are right at the moment in the room uh, through any, any level of mixed reality in different proportions over into AR, into full VR. And then you're gonna also have VR in which percentages of the real world are actually like allowed to pass inside, so you have this other kind of weird over the line there. Um, so anyway, the purple pill is a, a little bit about that, and, um, and just kind of not getting so dark and go to, the, go to the light side, it's a very exciting time also, you know, to be thinking about creative, you know, to think about the frontier in the same way that other mediums here, you know, music and film and, and all the arts, you know, are exciting. So we really need to see, um, I think, we, you know, we've been talking so much about VR, we forget that what we're really creating here 
is the full breadth of immersive media experience. And as you said, this is sort of a zero to 100 type of continuum where you're really looking at um, sort of AR to mixed reality to VR. Some of the things that you've talked a lot, a little bit right now are alluded to is the increment, is the types of um, uh, changes that we have to foresee as we move into this continuum of immersive experience. You know, there's this short, the, the short term um, incremental uh, um, evolutionary jumps in the form, which is two to three years, I think, you, you told me before. The midterm, which is, you know, what's going to happen in the next uh, five to ten years. And then the longer, much longer term, which is what's going to happen in the next decades or so. Given that you work at ILM XLab, which is arguably probably the best company to work in for immersive media, how are you guys seeing these different types of stages and, and what are the types of things you're working on? Um, okay, so the um, core of what ILM XLab is doing, what, where, where I am, um, is mostly uh, to look at a, we're looking at, we're looking at a couple of things. Um, one is, I, I mean, this is the great um, benefit of that place, right? The George Lucas essentially created a closed loop system in which he invented a universe. He started with inventing a universe in the way back times. And uh, heroes, journey, ask storylines and all that. Um, but then he, it, but he felt that he couldn't actually uh, create the universe with other means, so he made the means to create the universe. And then he was, you know, yeah, he's a very successful person, but like if you really listen to his comments, he's a quite revolutionary type. He really rejected uh, corporate, you know, thinking, uh, wanted to stay sort of, you know, independent. As big as he got, he still always did that. He still talks that way, mm -hmm. if you actually listen to his words. Um, anyway, he cre created this sort of like closed loop system where he could do everything from develop to make to release his own universe and stories. Uh, and that is a pretty cool foundational thing to walk into when, and it's still there, right? It resonates with a number of people there. And um, so, you know, XLab. Uh, sort of takes that to heart, right? That we're like, okay, at least with the foundational layer of Star Wars, we can do that. We can do all of that and be pretty much um, enabled to create the very, very first concept, understand how it fits inside the universe and on this map, you know? And what's really, really quite cool about it is, um, you know, because, I mean, because of the, uh, the sort of, uh, the pivot, I suppose, right? This Disney pivot, right? But they want to let us make stories for like another decade, you know? <laughs> they think like that on those terms. Uh, so we're plotting story across a decade, literally. Like imagine being in a creative war room in which you're plotting out the, the changes and trajectory of a universe and the storylines of various characters you know, through, uh, that will manifest in cinema, but not only cinema, right? They'll manifest in other media. There's, there's other things. There's games and there's comic books and blah, 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 right? And you can be contrived about it and call it transmedia, right? You know, in a consumery way, but you could also look at it as different expressions, right, of this story and universe. And so what's really cool about it is that it's okay. So XLab actually is a component of the same exact story group that plots that out, that map. The other side of the coin is um, what is a way to experience story in a new way? How do you drop someone into the timeline? And in what way, why would you pick a particular time and place to drop them in? Does it reflect off of something that you may have seen in cinema or some other, right? So you have like, you could just literally draw this sort of like diagram of where the different storylines and the different media are going, and you look at all the gaps, and you're like, oh, we could drop immersively into these gaps. Very interesting. You can create all these sort of tangentials. So that's right off the bat very interesting and unusual unless you have, you know, the benefit of the context, mm -hmm. right, of all this. So it's 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 part about that. It's part about understanding experience. And, it, and then I suppose it's really about like 
experience manifested in different types of forms and formats. So um, we carefully decided that, you know, we, we didn't decide to say, oh, XLab is a, uh, it's not a service bureau like ILA. It doesn't like, it's not a service bureau, right? It's an incubator of ideas and, and, and content. Um, it's not like a VR studio. We're not like completely transfixed only by VR, even though right now it's super exciting for obvious reasons. We, we labeled it, I suppose, immersive entertainment because immersive in general is umbrella, umbrella, umbrella in uh, mixed reality, virtual reality, immersive projection, theme parks, right? Real time, all sorts of things, expressions. It can be potentially interactive on mobile. There's a lot of ways it can be expressed. Um, so we, we use this term immersive entertainment. So with this purple pill in hand, you know, um, and with a sense of responsibility for creating, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, purple type immersive experiences and with the kind of story world that you have with Star Wars and the knowledge that you have this incredible time trajectory to play with, um, you've come up with a number of seminal um, experiences or frameworks that, that we want to share with you today. One of those is you alluded to is called the story portal and um, I just want to uh, show that um, as one of our next uh, videos that, that John has so kindly created just for you guys, okay? So let's look at this, or, and you can talk through it because there's no sound. Um, and this is a prototype uh, that John did um, as a kind of uh, touch point for the group to start thinking in these terms of how do we responsibly create transformative experiences that look at immersive media as a whole and start to really in, in, uh, do that um, across a variety of story forms. So. You want to talk a little bit about this? Oh, no sound. Yeah. Uh, is this the beginning of the video? This is the beginning of the video, yeah. OK. OK, so what you're looking at here, so we got a lot of things going on over there in this company besides concept and story. We have like very advanced graphics R&D groups. Um, ILM, but also we have an advanced real-time cinema lab, you know, that's using game, heavily modified game engines. Uh, so basically we are like bridging, we're bridging the sort of like high fidelity cinema methodologies with the game engines. Okay, what would the result be? Well, the result would be is we make content that is cinematic at that quality, but in actual fact it's being made on an engine. So it then becomes this sort of like amazing omnimedia. Like I could see a piece of cinema, but in actual fact, I could punch a portal into that cinema and I could sort of pass through on a second viewing. Now I wouldn't say that you would disrupt a, the sort of like experience of seeing a film, right? That's its own kind of experience. But you can come back and punch a hole in it. You can go through and walk into the setting and see this story sculpture from any perspective. It's sort of bullet tiny, right? But in addition, you can do things, right? You can basically lay out all sorts of parallel story tracks that were happening along the timeline outside of what you saw in the edited cut. And you can discover that stuff, right? But you can do so much more than that, right? You can, um, like this, have God's eye control, right? Like you could only do in virtual reality. You can change the, the, the speed, the pace. You can go where you want. You can explore. Right? If you saw something in the backdrop of the content, you could actually put yourself in there and experience that firsthand. You're now in the background of this scene, right? You could, that could all be live. This town could be a persistent, dynamic place. It could be a place like an online game, except to the hilt, right? It's a metaverse concept, right? So you can go into this destination and, and put serialized story passing through that while you are still free, right? You're free to explore, you're free to socialize, you're free to interact, you're free to do things. So it's kind of like a, it's a line that starts a story. For us, we care about cinema. We think cinema is still a forever medium and performance and humans in the media and all that. 
So I want to make sure that these guys know. So I just replayed it again. So this stuff that you're seeing, especially on the tablet, is being rendered in real time on the cloud. So this looks like film, but it's actually CG. It's real time graphics. Um, and um, the way they created the UI and um, the, the kind of way to experience the scene is extremely seamless. I had the, the pleasure of actually trying it out um, the first iteration of this, and um, the notion of being able to stop. I mean, we, you, you, basically, as you said, in bullet time, that's what was so amazing about that scene in The Matrix, is when, when that scene came on, everyone wanted to be able to get in there in that and actually jump into that scene and then be able to move around it, and you're doing this here. Yeah, it's a thread. I, there is a thread in the, in the, the things I'm curious about from that time to now. It's been nonstop. And I've had the benefit because you never, everyone, everybody, um, you know, does their work creatively in the films, I think, the same way, right? You just put yourself into it. You have no prediction or assumption of success or resonance. You do your best, right? So I got very lucky with the, with the Matrix, right? And there was resonance there. And the after effect, the knock-on effects of that, of course, has been folks who identified with that point of view were really interested even back then. And so from that time to now, I've had the benefit to meet many, many people you know, around the world in different facets of this um, who identified with the concepts in the film. Right? So it was a very interesting window all of a sudden for me to see, even as far back as then, people Right? We're like thinking about this even way before that, you know, with the uh, Evans and Sutherland, right? You know, mm -hmm. like they've been thinking about this forever. So at any rate, uh, there's been a through line all the way. Now, this is a two year, this is two years old, right? And so, um, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, re and, and you have to imagine that like years before that, right? The fun, the building blocks of that are actually, so that's actually how long Lucasfilm and ILM in general has been chiseling away at this. Um, you should assume that there, in future films you'll see virtual cinema, right? Uh, seamlessly blended into what appears to be normal cinema, right? That will actually be in fact portal. There will be portal opportunities. Um, you'll also notice there's no real actors in there yet. Well, that is by necessity. Right, because we're about to, we're not there quite yet, but we're about to enter an era where we need to put humans into this stuff. Like, the humans have to go into the engines, right? Uh, all of that stuff right there that I just showed, we do in VR as well. We put on just, there's a mobile device there, and this mobile device actually has a sensor attached to it, so we can do some, like, uh, uh, 4D uh, walking around experiences, but but we also do that entire experience in virtual reality. Um. And I think I want to talk, well, I mean, obviously the technology is amazing. But what is amazing about it, too, is that the technology disappears. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why the technology disappears is, A, it's so advanced um, in terms of the fidelity, the resolution, all that sort of stuff that you've talked, the performance optimization. But I think also it's because of the way you approach the notion of story portal. So when you were at Sundance, you were interviewed, and you talked a little bit about this notion of this layer cake, where um, you need, you know, with the story being at the top, the cinema experience being the second layer, and then the kind of ability to take then that that seminal scene of that cinematic experience that we all have collectively shared, and then being able to explore it, and then perhaps having some agency in that scene eventually, um, where you might be able to drive the X-wing or something like that. Um, how important, like, how much time do you guys spend in terms of determining what, where, where to put the portals, what kinds of portals you think may, uh, resonate with audiences? That's a good question. And things like we that. We can kill that clip because yeah. we're beating people over the head with Okay. It. I'm, oh, I'm completely over that now. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that's a really good question yeah. because that's, I mean, let's think about it. Um, you know, right now we're in this sort of like excited moment for VR, 
There's a lot of people in VR. There's not all. There's some people speaking here who are in the right wavelength. There's a lot of people in VR right now who are in VR simply because they have the keys to the car. They control the camera, right? The camera is this engine, right? The next camera. Um, and so there's a lot of folks who are sort of like, this is a strange, there's a strange sort of like separation right now that's going on. Like, oh, if you happen to like deep emotional, evocative performance and storytelling, well, you're stuck with 360 fixed point video. That's your medium, right? You're not moving around. You're not doing a lot of exploration and you're not doing a lot of interactivity. But creatively, I can't think of a creator alive who wouldn't be curious about designing their story in a way that allowed the audience at some point to explore beyond the, the, you know, the scene before you and in fact see real people, right, in an intimate pro within an intimate proximity with maximum beyond description emotional impact. Uh, and then allow you to sort of walk about that and walk around. So, you know, those folks, they're stuck in fixed point 360 mm -hmm. crap. Now, it's not crap. I won't say that. It's actually, <laughs> it's, a, it's an actually, it's actually, it's a, an absolutely vital building block. But it's crap that we're stuck in a fixed point. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and then you have the, uh, the gamers, right, that own this, that, that, that they know how to, innovate and engineer and hack this engine to enable exploration and interactivity. And there's remarkable things happening there. But they're, you know, they're designing according to their sensibilities, right? They want to play. Play is cool. Um, and so you have a lot of VR, you have like this sort of bifurcated evolution of VR going on. Mm -hmm. So what really is got to happen, forced to happen, is a mashing of those things, right? Where basically the person who can conceive of the moment that I saw on a screen that I still cannot forget decades later after I saw it the first time, um, is the same person driving a navigable, exploratory, and interactive experience. That, that has got to happen. It's got to be a frictionless process at some point where, like, if I want to make a story on film, I write it, I try to put it together, try to fund it, it gets crewed because the crew exists, the, the means exist, and off, I, and off we go and we make this, right? It needs to be that frictionless to make immersive experiences, but much more important to the point is that the kind of caliber of thinker, of moment making, right? Is those folks are still on the sideline, really have yet to enter this right now. And that is what's going to happen in the next few years. And do you think that those folks are like the Kubricks of the world or, you know, um, the, those kinds of filmmakers who really pushed the notion of cinema as this portal into the next, you know, in, into that world that we all desperately want to be in outside of reality, you know, because a lot of the, the, the experiences that, um, or the most immersive type of cinema, I think, do lend themselves um, best to cr being created yeah. in a VR kind of environment. You're compelled, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, really, we're going to get through this sort of like gimmicky phase where it's sort of like something that's different and like, okay, I want to try that. You know what I mean? Like, I have not tried um, scotch, so I'm going to try scotch now. Yeah. Um, we'll get past that quickly. And then it really will be really about the place you want to be and the thing you want to do. And there isn't any set of rules right now in which, I mean, I, I personally feel that the, the reason why things like cinema or, and or television, et cetera, is a global media experience in which any person in the world can come into that kind of experience innately understanding the lang the grammar. Like, imagine before cinema existed, how weird it would seem to people that it, editing, for example, right, or sculpted, sculpted perspectives, like how weird is that, right? 
But yet now every person, like you could live on an island nation in Micronesia and understand editing, right? Like the sort of compression of time and the sequence of events and sort of like connection of ideas that editing has, has created. Well, there is going to be a language like that that's at this moment like unclear, but it'll be for virtual reality. It'll be for augmented reality. Mixed reality in general, augmented reality, mixed reality, these terms, these terms keep floating around. Augmented reality is probably going to mean adding information to everything, analytics, what have you. A mixed reality really is like having content present with you. It could be like characters and things and constructs and like three-dimensional things that are sort of like meshed, you know, et cetera. I'll just make that point because people get hung up. Um, but at any rate, that language, the grammar, is we got 50 years of chiseling on that. Yeah, and I think that's an important point to make because, um, you know, uh, I think we forget how long it actually takes to invent the, the grammar of the medium. And, you know, Janet Murray, who's, who wrote Hamlet on the holodeck and has been talking about immersive media since 1997, um, is also concurs that this, this language takes a long time to develop. The question though is, do you think that there are certain technologies that are necessary for that grammar to be invented um, uh, more quickly? So in, in particular, volumetric film. Everyone keeps talking about volumetric film. Like, do you think that the, the next Kubrick, who's gonna make that seminal um, virtual reality um, uh, cinema feel that ha allows people agency, that allows people to really, f um, you know, drop into that rabbit hole, requires that piece of technology. Well, as you know, I mean, Kubrick, who I worshipped when I was younger, uh, he did, he was an inventor. Every, uh, every film was an invention. That Kubrick was the person that took a camera off of a crane and put it in, on a Steadicam. Steadicam, in, Steadicam began right? The freedom, what appeared to be limitlessness, right? So he's a person that did that. He invented lenses that could like light scenes, with, so you could light scenes with candles because he wanted that intimacy of candlelight, right? So there are a lot of, not, there aren't a lot of people like that, but there are people like that right? yeah. amongst us, right? Could be any person in this room could be that person. Um, uh, any person with bad hair playing chess in Austin today could be that person. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so, uh, but do, you know, yes, they need some tools, but they also have to say what the tool, what tools they want. Like, it's just going to happen. I need these tools. So, I mean, it's like anything else. Um, Kubrick, where did he, he learned cinema at NYU. That's where I went. That's where I learned about it, where he was, because I saw the same cement chess boards he used to play at. Right? I thought that was cool. I was going to school and there's a cement chess board <laughs> that he played chess at in between working on films. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and he obviously, so with that, to me, it's sort of like uh, where people learn, university, it couldn't be, the more, it couldn't be a more, more important place right now in terms of like gro grooming, right, the inventors that are going to like make these tools because they want to do something they haven't been able to do So the maker storyteller is what we're really looking for um, for this future. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that a lot of the stuff that you've done um, right now in ILM X Lab is really uh, not necessarily inventing a whole new, f new technologies, but almost cobbling together technologies that have been around for quite a long time. And one of the next video I want to show you is a, another one of the, these amazing experiments. And um, I'll just play it. <laughs> so maybe you can explain it, John. Oh, okay. No sound either. Oh, gee, this, okay. this is kind of an so, older one. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so. Another, there are various ways of accessing cinema or experiences. I don't, I don't want to keep saying cinema, but accessing experiences um, in different dimensional ways. It, VR is not the only one. So you can see the perspective of things changing with the camera, actually, because we're tracking the camera. Um, what the, all this stuff is is immersive projection, right? It's, there, are, there are 3D projectors, but the 
but the, the person who is viewing the content is being tracked, their point of view is being tracked, which means in a game engine, we basically assign the camera to their head, right? So anywhere they are, their perspective is being rendered live to them. And we're doing this at near cinema fidelity, right? And so as a preview to mixed reality and augmented reality to come, we've used projection, right, as a proxy, an in-betweener, right? And we, we've, we do it in a few ways. We also do it with mobile devices, waiting for these gla so-called glasses to show up. Um, so that is basically an old technology. I think the University of Chicago started caves, if you will. Caves have been around forever. Caves are usually used for scientific visualization or if you're like advanced automotive or aerospace, use caves to sort of walk around engines and things like this. And, uh, we decided to use caves to put creative character-based content Right off the bat, we, did, we started this several years ago as well. What we did was we pivoted uh, many, many person years of research into virtual set type stuff, as in, as in like li uh, comp live action compositing for film, if you know what I mean, uh, motion capture, a variety of other techniques. And we basically wrote the drivers to port that into an immersive cave and so the result of it is basically I can just put a very, very lightweight, what appears to be like just 3D shutter glasses with extra trackers on it, and you can walk in 4D around, in 360, you can walk around content, walk around it. Um, and it's perfect to your perspective. And it gives, gives us this sort of like preview of augmented reality, of mixed reality. Um, and so what we, what we call it is holo cinema, holographic cinema. Um, and it's another example of using pre-existing building blocks just for a different creative intent. And like, you know, we started with um, this a tiny little mention of bullet time. Bullet time was very similar. Bullet time, this other thing that we did in the, in the early matrix days, which we call universal capture, which was like camera arrays and measurement to create a volumetric capture of a live action performer, for example. We use pre-existing building blocks, but in a, a different, for a different creative application, and with a, a, a purpose in mind, which was to sort of like make that point about the God's eye. And again, you know, is it, is it a lot easier for you because you're working on with content that everyone knows? I mean, part of the, part of the, the difficulty in being indie maker storytellers, right, <laughs> is that we could kind of cobble together stuff. We're happy to stick sensors on glasses and things like that. But we're hampered by the fact that the content we're working with isn't necessarily the, the stuff that people, that people know and therefore they know exactly how to emotionally engage with that content. Um, what's some of your advice to people who, don't, who doesn't have the kind of toolbox that you have, um, not from a technology perspective, but from a story universe perspective? Well, there's two, okay, there's two, two things I would say to that. I mean, um, and again, like I'm talking, we'll talk about the next two to three years. Okay. So, any, probably any person who makes a film understands that uh, it's already immensely difficult to have enough exposition on a brand new original concept, right? Like if you're, if this is a brand new story, it's a new world, right? You are fighting screen time to get enough exposition so that, uh, so that those characters become authentic, right? So that when you arrive at those arcs, those milestone points, Right? People are like engaged, invested, and like with you and understand. It's just, there's a foundation. It's hard to, it's hard to lay that on an original property. And that's, that sometimes separates, right? The bright and brilliant ones from the rest. Because they figured out a, the, the most efficient way, right? Of laying out the world. Um, and the performance, of course, what the actors bring, right? Like, so you, either are or you are not invested in that character based on the way that the subtleties of the performance. At any rate, so that's hard, right? It's already hard with the movie length, right? So right now we're like in this era where all these VR pieces, they're short. 
because they're, they're like rocket lifts, each one of them. They're like mini rocket lifts to do these things technically. There's no long form, and nobody has even a sense of what um, the right amount of time to be inside and experience is anyhow. Um, so context helps. So if you happen to be doing something like, you know, Luckily, we have you know this huge this universe. That everyone knows, like everyone in this room could probably tell me some fact about Star Wars. They have some sense of what it is. They know who char what characters are. They're relevant. It helps arm the everyday person with knowledge. And so I'm like, all right, I'll try this foreign thing because I want to be there. Because I know, you know, I have my own feelings about what's relevant. I know when I see something, oh, that's important. Sometimes, you know, I think that VR and AR are perfect complements to cinema, where you laid out a foundation in the storyline and what's authentic. It doesn't mean that you're doing a pure recreation. It can be clearly a, an expansion, extension, a sort of place, right, that shines a light backwards, all those types of things. So I think context matters a lot in arming the, uh, and it's pro this, is, this is true of games as well, VR and games as well, right? You come in understanding the universe and you kind of know what's relevant going. So I do think that VR will be greatly enhanced in the next two to three years by, with all the pieces that have that context working in the background with the folks who are trying it for the first time. But that said, I do think that two things will make, will deepen an original experience a lot. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have that happening. One would be um, serializing experiences so that we can like take the time to deepen the story like a good TV show, right? Like with Breaking Bad, you're 10 shows in and you're yeah. completely addicted. So, so you make context making a part of the experience. Yes, and you don't yeah. short form it. You don't give it short shrift like it's just a theme park thing that you need to run in and out at. Mm -hmm. oh. um, so serialized virtual experiences are seem really obvious. Um, the other thing I would also say, which isn't obvious, but if, unless you've tried it, you would know. Um, social, being there with somebody else, can, is actually, I feel like, an X factor that could be the difference between someone wanting to do something for mere minutes and wanting and losing themselves for hours. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, like, there's just really clear evidence at this point that folks who are trying social VR things, where you're just with friends, um, lose sense of time and stay in for hours. So to do something social within, you know, whatever this creative art story piece that you make, but to do that with others. Now that then creates some complications too insofar as a lot of folks are wondering, oh, we're gonna like reinvent storytelling and we're gonna make you the person upon which all story is hinged upon. And I am dubious a little bit about that for, I don't believe that there's a lot of first person movies for a reason that's difficult to sculpt a first person, a movie that's directed at the viewer. So it's got to be done in a particular way in which you have agency and participation, but I'm not sure yet if you're the key turner in a, in a, a choose your own adventure um, insofar as there's a lot of people who think that's the direction, and I'm not so confident yet about that. I'm not saying it won't be cracked, but I think it will be an issue. Um, so, at any rate, the reason why I brought that up is because if you're in there with friends and someone has designed something to be pointed at you, then what are your friends supposed to do? Whereas if you're there uh, together and the story is flowing through, then you've experienced it together, you've had a shared memory together, and you can, in fact, turn around and explore and play and make your own st story at will at the, bound at the expository boundaries you know what I mean, of some story sculpture that someone may have sent through. Well, I think that still the, one of the best um, uh, Rift experiences I've ever had is playing Portal on the Rift. Because it takes two things that you guys have, it takes one thing that you've done right and then the, what you just talked about in terms of social. The first one is that the, the people in it are robots. 
So there's a lot of forgiveness that can happen when the objects that you inhabit as a role and, the, and, and your friend inhabits are these like mechanical things. Mm -hmm. There can be some uh, anthropomorphic mm -hmm. uh, gestures, but it, it works, you know? Yes. And then secondly, um, it is fun. It, it, the, the, the world itself is, is, has a very specific, you know, goal, which is make these holes, try to get out. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to just kind of wander around that world as a robot. Um, and uh, I, I'm surprised that there aren't as many of those kinds of social experiences being created. Yeah, I think that'll be yeah. a, pretty much a big bang thing of the next couple years as well. I mean, I do think that it'll be clear. I mean, I can just guess, but I'm going to guess that once it's really in the public's hands, not the developers per se, that all the social stuff will shoot up to the top of popularity. And the question is like, what is the, what is the, the skin, if you will, you know what I mean, in which you are with others? Mm -hmm. And do you think it will be uh, framed within these locked environments? Or, um, you know, how are you, because what, the thing about hollow cinema that's fantastic is that it really bleeds into the world. The virtual world bleeds into your real world and um, as opposed to, to these isolated um, uh, yeah. frameworks you know, that good, we're in right now. It's a very good point. I mean, like, I feel that, uh, okay, so back to the zero to 100, I mean, the purple pill. Um, it's not very uh, normal and human to have a box on your head in a room full of people without boxes on their heads. <laughs> It's, it's funny, you know, like we, you know, sort of go into this and like everyone's all giddy about it and then eventually you end up at a party or a, a setting at some place, right? And there's a cluster of people who have boxes on their heads and a cluster that does not. And you're like, okay, I have to step over those people. The people, at least, I mean, circa 2015, 16, right? They're, people are just starting to get into connected social VR experiences, but a lot of them aren't at the moment. So they're all in there isolated, right? And so we all probably, everyone's seen the little picture of the person cringed in the corner, lost in the corner by themselves, yeah. you know what I mean? That's not the future anybody wants. So, and, and nor, you just do, it's inevitable that it cannot be, it just cannot be unhuman in order for it to be socially acceptable. So it's an inevitability that the technology has to shrink and become ubiquitous. It has to feel like stuff that we're already comfortable with. And so I pretty much, I feel like there's a sort of a convergence that just is gonna happen across the next 10 years in which the AR mixed reality stuff, right, which again is also silly in looking at the moment like, uh, like it looks like something from Star Trek. Um, and the VR stuff, which still looks silly, silly boxes, Right? Those two technologies mash together, and eventually you have this ubiquitous thing on your face, or not even on like your that. face, <laughs> that you can dial. Yeah, what you drew there. <laughs> yeah, that actually was a mod of that. Yeah. We modded that. But you can, um, you can dial anything from zero to 100. So zero is where reality. We're going to have an immense appreciation for real reality, actual reality. Right? <laughs> it, in fact, I'm already just doing all this work has made me really actually look at real reality. <laughs> right? I'm like, gee whiz, how does that really go down? Holy, that's fucking it's super complicated, yeah. right? Like bodies slumped together and like light and you know, unpredictable simulations of real things. So anyway, zero reality, mixed reality. Okay, we've decided to load a proportion of our real world view with our friends and everything, our world with a percentage of other stuff, which we believe is there because it's been rendered in such a fashion that we can focus upon it like the real world. We can accommodate on it. It is integrated flawlessly as in it receives all light in the same way that everything and everybody is receiving light. And it's reactive, right? It's cognizant of its surrounding. It has a deep mind. Okay, so you have this mixed reality in the middle, and then the same glasses, or whatever it is, dials to 100, and we're all inside, and hopefully connected together, and no more foreign isolated you know, experiences. I think that's the, that's the moonshot for 10 years, 
that's where it becomes mainstream. Um, it'll still be strange for everybody. I think it's really odd to be living in a so-called free country. We don't, where we sort of, we might, uh, you know, we might be the last generation that remembers um, what it's like to have privacy. Mm -hmm. So I feel like one of the litmus tests of whether it goes mainstream, mm -hmm. do you mind if I riff? No, I was going to go there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, one of the litmus tests that makes it mainstreamable is if folks are allowed to be um, anonymous. And not just the ones wearing the devices, but anyone in front of the devices. I would like this pl these platforms to succeed and become mainstream. But I not at the expense. Yeah, but yeah. I won't do it myself yeah. Yeah. unless I know that I can be encrypted in, in, yeah. in before the eyes of a person with yeah. this technology. And that's why I think blockchain could be quite an interesting technology once you start to migrate that into to VR, is if I can own my own digital identity and only allow, and I have complete control over me and who gets access to it and who doesn't and how I represent myself in different ways. Um, that's really when, uh, I just don't know whether we'll ever get there. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really worried that we are, you know, that, 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 that the powers that be are forcing a, more red in the purple It's a in David and Goliath pill. story. Yeah. There's a David and Goliath story that isn't talked about much. And that is uh, the dark web yeah. enables people to be anonymous. And there are good and bad things about that. Dark web practically invented by what, the military, right? Mm -hmm. And or... Um, but there's really, really bad people in the dark web. Um, but if we're not too late, right, to sort of teach that uh, your personal privacy is probably the singular, one of the singular most valuable assets that you have, right, and that you can control. Yeah. Right? Um, I think if that, if people still believe that, that the David is going to be the, sa the search engine, the VR platform, the a AR platform, what have you, that enables encryption. I think that you see a change in what's going on with the big tech codes right now, in which mm -hmm. they see that mm -hmm. David out there, right? Where mm -hmm. the sort of folks who are sort of allowing anonymity, right, have garnered a certain audience and they're wondering how fast that audience will grow because mm -hmm. it could take them down yeah or so either they become more like that yeah which i think is going on with apple right now yeah um and things that google says too i believe actually oddly i believe them right now this this group of leaders i believe cares and you can sort of see evidence that they do because they fight it out in the courts so it can't be just pr Right? They're in the courts fighting. So that at least the current generation that runs these tech codes seems, some tech codes, seems to believe that, that anonymity and privacy does matter, despite having the world's most powerful tracking software also <laughs> for advertising. Yeah. At any rate, I think that's the litmus test. And I think the David is the one that comes up with the encrypted platform for everyone. I think that's a great place for us to end, but I wanted to get, uh, do I have time for questions? Yes, but I wanted to get a couple of questions from the audience. Yep. I think that um, there's no rules that are, there should be no rules. I think that, I mean, just, it's human nature to understand a linear story, but there are a lot of things that are super expressive and fun that are not linear. Um, you see a lot of creative things that, you know, sort of visual music mm -hmm. that is so enjoyable and visceral and artistic, and you don't care if it's linear. So it's really, it's as open as any other medium, right? It's going to be as diverse as any other medium. It's all going to be based on the artists that that comes to it, and, I th and, and whether they compel the audience. But I think there's as much room for nonlinear, abstract, all sorts of stuff, you know what I mean? It'll, they'll all 
find their audiences in some fashion if they're great. Yeah, can you guys go to the mic? Would you mind? Sorry. I think they're taping it. Uh, along those lines, considering the fact that how we're going to tell stories in this medium has clearly not been figured out, in context of you know the film festival that's rounding up, what about a space for, for independent filmmakers and documentary filmmakers, especially as we're trying to figure out stories and people that are already kind of pushing boundaries in terms of stories and playing with this. Is there room for them at this stage? And if so, like, what are some things that you would recommend to South by Southwest filmmakers? I think there's more room for them than not because they're not making necessarily calculated decisions on the end result of their film and story based on market, market scale. Mm -hmm. They're trying to find their audience with something th that they want to say. And that is the exact time that we're in right now in terms of VR, which is it needs experimental people that are willing to sort of like do that, right? That aren't so taken down by their structure, you know what I mean, the business, that they can um, produce something original. There's going to clearly be some. You look at Chris Milk, who's here also. You know, you just it, there's going to be people who are going to crack into this and become very important folks because of that exact means. You know what I mean? Of creating independently, th you know, made content. Right? It's it. I think anyone it. Anyone who makes into, you know, smaller independent films and maybe has had the benefit to go on to large films will tell you that it's as hard, if not harder. Less money makes it much more of a Rubik's Cube. You know what I mean? If you, you have to be so exacting with every single decision in order to come out at the other end with something great. So it's a great skill set, right? It's a great sensibility to go into first ever VR explorations. Thank you. I appreciate the panel. So I've been thinking about this for a little while and so the, the only thing I could think of which is kind of along the lines of what he was asking is is maybe texture mapping in a, in a game engine as a way of being able to tell a rudimentary story because then you can still, if you're texture mapping video on something then you might be able to be exploratory in that. Do you have any recommendations on, you know, fairly decent and easily understood game engines that are out there, uh, they're open source that we could, you know, so that, that we might be able to use as a way of texture mapping onto some object in there and be able to tell a story in that way. So are, what game engines would you recommend and what kind of like, from the practical side, how-to side, uh, what game engines, what texture mapping software, what are tools that you could recommend for doing some experimental stuff where you might be able to tell a really compelling story, but allow the, the user the ability to have uh, initiative. Okay, well, first of all, I'm not gonna sell software, but the thing I would, what I would, what you want, right, is a large uh, artist and technician base so that you can actually, quote unquote, crew up and, have, and, and sort of like sandbox, right? So, Honestly, I mean, just like there's only three or four major movie cameras that people use for a reason, right? And every, there's a lot of technicians that know how to master those things. And so you're like, okay, I know the guy who knows the red and the Alexa, what have you. In the game engine world, it's like Unreal and Unity primarily, but not exclusively. But you'll find the most artists working in those two. Um, even in this town, this town is loaded with them. Mm -hmm. You can find folks right here right, they master those engines and some of them would be very interested in doing something that isn't just an app, you know. Um, as far as the, um, the techniques per se, I mean they're, again, it, I think it comes down to, to an individual by individual basis. Some people, despite going into the gaming industry, have a love of photography and though that, so they experiment there. And so you do need to, I would say, start with finding individuals that have an affinity for it, who are interested in it. They may not be the masters yet, but if they're interested in it, in that problem, then, and that's as simple as asking the same said talent, you know what I mean, who's, who's intrigued by that approach. I guess that what you're saying is that it's really one of these um, 
iterative processes where you're just constantly, if you're looking at how, how to use videos as textures on, in gaming engines, you just gotta keep trying it and seeing what, what performance, look, behavior works for the type of story you're trying to tell. And unfortunately, it is about just trying all the time. And just one real quick follow-up. What do you think the best watering hole online is for finding people that are in, engaged in this website and or other sources? Where should we be looking to? Where are you from? Are uh, you from LA. Austin? Yeah, oh, you're from, from LA. LA. Oh, oh VRLA? Like, would you go yeah, to those meetups? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. It, yeah, go to the community. Yeah. You'll find a million people. Not well, maybe a hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, hi, John. Um, my name is Simon. I had the similar question for Chris Milk too, but I was interested to find out what your predictions, uh, crystal ball predictions for the future of the film industry with more sensors being included and, and multiplayer experiences which are already emerging. And how does that affect you know, the kind of Hollywood engine as a whole and the award show systems and all that kind of thing. But then also um, for user experiences, I wanted to ask I'll, you know, I'll let, I'll let you answer the first one, I guess. Okay. Um, so, I, as I mentioned before, I mean, I don't actually see for a really long time, if not forever, the uh, instinctual love and or addiction of humans for other humans. As in, we love to go to the movies to see people we can identify with or not, right? Embroiled or engaged in fantasy and other things, right? That's why we make movies, right? To, to escape. I don't see that the artistry of escapism that is mastered in film is going to go anywhere, you know, soon. I think, though, that everybody is intrigued by the potential of stepping within the intimate proximity of said things, right? Um, Every person who's sort of like on ramps to that will have will be a different type of person with a different sort of um, interest in like, oh, how interactive do I feel like being? Some people don't really want to be interactive. Some people want to be highly interactive. So it'll be like really diversified things. But at the end of the day, if Hollywood and or the film business is the business of making stories in universe, it's unnatural for them to expand into immersive entertainment, not just VR. And then, and then the other thing I would, I would say is that we had a prior decade where we saw the gaming industry become massive and equal the film industry in terms of its sort of revenue. And you didn't invest in it at that time, <laughs> the, the Hollywood. And, we, yeah. and we, we couldn't figure out a way to align or bridge or overlap with one another, right? It's weird that the group still didn't like overlap. It made sense in a way, right? Because oh, I'm going to make a game about this, make a movie about, but it, it was very superficial and stayed pretty much separated. It was like two cultures that couldn't overlap. VR and AR are actually probably the real bridge. This is where we sort of like actually, we're literally like, look at Austin as this giant Petri dish. There's overlapping that's going to happen. It'll be something, we, we can't even predict what the result of that will be, but movies will go nowhere, games will go nowhere, VR and AR immersive entertainment will grow and will mush together it's inevitable. there. There you have it. Sorry, uh, Simon. Well, the tertiary question was okay. about uh, past properties, like visiting old movie sets, like, I don't know, uh, Spielberg's yeah. Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind and Third Kind and Climbing Up the Mountain or uh, Kurosawa, Rance. So yeah. Know, but you're going backwards and recreating those immersive Look, I mean, properties. I'll just say one thing about that, okay? For those who have had the benefit to walk amongst the sets next to actors or seen takes be made, okay, you have a human, super high order memory of seeing that in real life. I've done that, right? And it's very different than seeing it on the wide screen, right? Behind a window that is separating you. But if you're there and you're walking around as a human in 4D, <laughs> right? Now imagine people can do that, right? That, 
makes that set. Imagine that we could volumetrically capture everything happening there and then build it out, place it inside a wider universe. We can take a right turn and keep going. That's what I think we're heading towards. Excellent. Thank you very much, John.